The main text in Sikhism is the Adi Granth. It is 1,430 pages long. You don't need to know that number. That's not going to come up on an exam, but just kind of give you an idea of the size of it. The term itself means first book. And here, of course, first meaning in, in prominence. It is also referred to as Guru Granth Sahib, which means the revered book that is the Guru. As you can see from the, uh, the pictures there, it is written in Guru Murthy's script. In Sikh houses of worship, the text has a room of its own, where it is kind of kept. Um, it is presented with food uh, during the services, and that food is then later distributed to the congregation. The text is mostly devotional poems. Uh, composed by the early gurus, especially Guru Nanak. But other poems from North Indian poets have made its way, even some that would not be seen. They are meant to be sung uh, and are divided in the book according to different musical styles. During services, readings are often selected by just kind of randomly opening the book and then reading whatever appears on the left page, the left-hand page. That's where you start. It is, of course, the principal sacred text for Sikhs. Uh, the process took several centuries. And as we mentioned, of course, with the 10th Guru's death, it is considered to be the leader, the guru, uh, the teacher of the community. There are some other books that are uh, important as well, um, but all of them rank below the audio one of those is the Dawson Gram, it means the Book of the Ten. The works in the Dawson Gram are attributed to the tenth guru, Gobind Singh. It includes hymns uh, as well as biographical information, uh, accounts of Sikh heroes, and some discussion of Hindu deities, and poems from a variety of other sources as well. Question about God or the Adi Granth? You mentioned that it discusses other Hindu deities, but they mm -hmm. don't believe in Akma, right? Right. And so there's kind of, you know, this kind of discussion of what do these deities represent and the differences between God and. Do they believe that Akma is the God of like, Muslims as well? Mm -hmm. You would find some that would believe that. Um, as far as, especially for Muslims. Uh, Muslims, on the other hand, wouldn't, wouldn't agree with that. But, you know, usually there is that kind of, you know, that, that there's a, a recognition of, of God in these religions, and Sikhs would have, they would believe more revelation about it or something like that. Other questions? Throughout the existence of the early years of Sikhism, especially if you're talking about in a Muslim-controlled area. Uh, and so there was a lot of persecution those early Sikhs received. In response to this persecution, the Khalsa was created. The one purpose of the Khalsa was the preservation of the faith. It is just one part of the larger Sikh community. Not everyone who is a Sikh is a member of the Khalsa. The term itself means pure ones. And it's a elite group that follows a very strict lifestyle and are considered to be guardians of the faith. There are a variety of interesting stories, especially related to the, the formation. Uh, the first group evidently was chosen by uh, the 10th Guru, Gobind Singh. And I think Koran talks about this story uh, in the chapter on Sikhism. So he asks for volunteers uh, willing to give up their lives to become you know, a part of this, um, this elite group. And so you know, one, one by one, five volunteers uh, agree to come with him into the, in, enter into this tent. And as each goes in, uh, the others hear the squish of a sword and a, and a head falling to the ground. And so one by one, these five go in. After all five go in, the curtain is drawn back to show all five are alive. And then that, there's differences. 
some stories say there are five decapitated goats. Right? And so there was somebody getting their head chopped off. So the point was, will these people be willing to come in? Other stories say uh, Sin had killed them all and then brought them back to life. But the idea is he's forming an elite group. Today, a very egalitarian group, both men and women, can join. Uh, also today, there are hundreds of rules that are to be followed, only some of which date back to the time of the 10th Zimri. A member of the Khalsa is marked by the wearing of five symbols known as the five Ks. The first is uncut hair, believed to be, a, if you're uh, you know, committing to the Khalsa, it is a sin to cut your hair. Um, many Sikhs, especially males, uh, will not cut their hair, but especially for uh, the Khalsa. And so part of the reason why um, many Sikhs will wear turbans is to cover up their hair. Um, the second of the five Ks is to wear a comb. The third, the wearing of a steel dagger or sword. The fourth is a steel ring. And the fifth is a pair of shorts, specifically an undergarment that is meant to preserve modesty. They are called, it's called, these markers are called the 5K because in the Punjabi language all of them begin with K. All right, you probably can't make it out on this, but you know, these are the the 5K and the, uh, they, and they all start with K. You don't need to know those, I just want you to know these. <laughs> being a member of the Tulsa means being egoless, egoless, not having an ego, and that will burn your karma. You will vanquish uh, the five sins, and you will leave attachment. Other uh, important aspects of Sikh ritual. Very important for Sikhs is prayer. Prayers are offered usually three times a day. Early morning, at sunset, and before bed. There are formulaic prayers based on specific hymns. The prayers themselves take about a total of two hours to set. Uh, they are used to get rid of negative thoughts, pay homage to God, to recognize God's presence, to recognize how God pervades the world. And kind of, this is uh, kind of related to the notions of karma and samsara within Sikhism. Karma, or karam, is not absolute. It is subject to divine laws, unlike in other forms that we've seen. It can be overridden in the name of justice through divine grace. So grace in Sikhism, based through devotions uh, like prayers, can break the chain of karma or karam. The goal of life is to escape sansara or samsara and connect with the divine, and to transcend this self-centeredness by this kind of interior remembrance of the divine name. Another important part of Sikh ritual uh, are the gurdwaras, or Sikh houses of worship. Usually, a, a rectangular hall with a place for the scriptures. There's also a kitchen for the preparation of the communal meal, this kitchen known as the longar, or a meal also known as longar. In the West, the main service is usually held on Sunday, but usually this is more of convenience and custom than any sort of strong tradition. In other places, the day might be different. Seating is traditionally on the floor, there is no set schedule of arriving or leaving. Uh, after the service is over, everyone present participates in the long bar, the communal meal. 
Everyone sits together, even in places like India, irregardless of caste. And so caste is ignored in the name of equality. This is this. Sikhs also celebrate a variety of festivals, many of them connected with Hindu festivals. On April 13th, Sikhs observe the anniversary of the community origination, but they also observe Diwali and Holi, usually with different emphases. And Diwali is a time to remember the imprisonment of the Jews under Muslim emperors. On, on, on Holi, Sikhs usually follow the custom of the throwing the paint, etc. But the day after that, they perform military exercises, as well as other contests in India. Not surprisingly, other holidays will include um, the days, uh, the birthdays of Guru Nanak, some other important gurus as well. There are also a variety of life cycle rituals. Sikhs tend to follow the Indian custom of arranged marriage, especially in India. The Sikh ritual follows the Indian one, but there are readings from uh, the scriptures. They also follow the Indian practice of cremation. There are initiation rituals in the Khalsa, usually at the age of 14. We'll finish up by talking about a couple things uh, related to modern expressions of Sikhism. One aspect of Sikhism today is the Sikh diaspora. When we talk about diaspora, when we talk about Judaism, this idea of dispersion. Most of the immigration of Sikhs around the world has taken place in the 20th century into the 21st. Many of those who immigrated uh, were men who left their families to be farmers in places like California. Many of those Sikhs that live in the diaspora um, have resisted assimilation. They continue to wear their turbans and other things that uh, mark them as distinctive. In some places, however, younger Sikhs have felt pressures of, of cutting their hair, uh, pressures of wearing a sword, right? Not wearing a sword, I mean, you know. But, um, and so in some cases, Sikhs have opt opted to wear a miniature sword or a symbol with a necklace with a sword on it, you know, something to symbolize that as opposed to, you know, trying to carry a sword around with you or a dagger. After 9-11, of course, some people, have some people have confused Sikhs with Muslims, and so right after then there was a, a lot of persecution. In fact, the first person to die in some of the persecution, the anti-Muslim uh, violence, was actually a Sikh. Not too many people convert to Sikhism, uh, especially the traditional form of Sikhism. But there have been some movements uh, that have had minor success with converts. Many of them dealing with a lot of things related to Western therapeutic culture, and so presenting Sikhism as a, uh, as a means to health, and to happiness, uh, you know, there's, and so some of those movements that have won the most converts in the West have been those that have focused on therapeutic concerns and kind of westernized some of those Indian views, just kind of like the same things that happens with yoga. Last thing uh, to talk about. In, in recent years, there's been a lot of tensions between Sikhs and uh, especially the Indian government. Uh, in 1947, when Pakistan was created as a separate country, it was split uh, right down, the Punjab was split right down the middle. Um, and so some Sikhs living in Muslim countries, some Sikhs living in a Hindu country. The two million Sikhs that were living on the Pakistani side of the Punjab were forced to migrate to India. And so violence became part of the interactions between Indian Sikhs from 1978 to 1992. Uh, the government in India passed some anti-Sikh policies. Some Sikhs uh, were separatists, wanted to push for an independent state so that they could practice without fear of persecution. In 1984, the Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, attacked the Golden Temple, which was on that first slot, uh, one of Sikhism's holiest shrines. Uh, believing that the separatists were stockpiling weapons there. 
There was violence ensued. Eventually, the Prime Minister herself was killed by her Sikh bodyguards. Additional violence ensued with thousands of dead. Um, the, this picture coming from Time Magazine in 1984. You can't read the caption probably. A Sikh family in front of their dwelling after a rampaging mob attacked the property. Uh, I want to see Sikh blood on the streets, said an ang angry Hindu. Uh, even more recently, there have been other situations of, of governors or, or others uh, pursuing anti-Sikh policies, sometimes killed by bodyguards who happen to be Sikh. Why, you know, if you're going to be anti-Sikh, why you are hiring Sikh bodyguards? Uh, doesn't seem to be something that would, would make a lot of sense. Questions about Sikhism. All right, on Thursday we will pick up with the last of the Indian religions we're looking at, is Buddhism. Uh, we'll say more about the assignment for next week as well as